Hello and welcome to episode 89, part 2 of Awesome Astronomy for November 2019. Now, normally, this is the part of the show where we drone on and on about something moderately relevant to something that's going on in the world to while away the minutes until we actually get into the show to give you guys enough time to settle down, grab your cuppa, wrestle your best cushion off the dog. (laughs) Is that enough time? You sat down yet? Well, tough tits if not, uh, (laughs) because we're about to begin. (laughs) Joining me this month as we stomp our way around all things spacey is the ever-enthusiastic Paul. Yes! Woo! Woo Woohoo! Yeah! (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha! Ha ha! Hello! And bring it up the rear, it's Ralph. Who, matron? (laughs) 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 Paul, not there. Uh, dear listeners, you may be interested to know that uh, Ralph is three quarters of the way through a bottle of wine with nothing else in his system, so this is going to be an interesting episode. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it is indeed. So, Ralph, you've got something to tell us. I have, that um, the originator of the Leonid Meteor Shower, um, uh, Russian cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, or is it Leonid Brezhnev? We were having this discussion sure. earlier. Uh, it's neither, it turns out. Um, uh, <laughs> this is just three quarters of a bottle of wine speaking. Uh, this has got absolutely nothing to do with uh, Please help me, somebody. <laughs> Where are we? I was hoping you were going to talk about Washington. <laughs> oh, Alexei no, we've got the Le- passing Le- of Alexei Leonov. The originator of the Leonid Meter Show. Uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Alexei Leonov, the Russian cosmonaut, the first person to do a spacewalk, uh, which lasted for 12 minutes. And in fact... Um, in his book uh, that he wrote with Dave Scott, which I would absolutely recommend that anyone goes and reads because it's one of those few books where you get the Russian perspective on um, uh, on, on the space race as well. Um, when, I remember when I was reading through all the... I'm going off on a tangent here, but when I was reading all the um, the Apollo books, uh, I was craving for something that gave an explanation and a feeling of what was thought from the Russian side of things. And there really weren't any, certainly not in the English language. Um, but this this book from Alexei Leonov, I think it's called... It might be called Red Moon, but I'm... I'm, I'm Pissed. Trying to remember now, and a little bit drunk. But there's a book that's written by Dave Scott, the Apollo 15 astronaut, and um, Alexei Leonov, who was the first um, person to do a spacewalk. They did half and half of a book from different perspectives. It's an absolutely fantastic book. And he also mentioned in there about how close he was to death on that first spacewalk because of the inflation of the suit. He couldn't actually get back into the spacecraft, so he had oh, to God. start deflating his spacesuit. Um, to enable him to get back into the hatch, which is an absolutely terrifying thought yeah. that you're going to reduce that pressure out in space, not knowing whether you can, you know, uh, actually stop the leakage <laughs> of air. Jesus. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, sadly, Alexei Leonov, who was one of the last, uh, one of the remaining people from that era that I was desperate to get an interview with, um, has passed away. So he's no longer with us. And all those memories and all that exploration and all his stories from um, a, a different side of the space race uh, are gone from us now. And it's just a, just really, really sad. Yeah, But his meteor shower lives on. Indeed. But of course, you've been having adventures of your own, not quite as far away as uh, space, but you know, well, actually, uh, saying I would that, actually say further away, significantly yeah, further away. Yeah, it is actually away. further away because space is only like 80 miles up, whereas you are many thousands of miles away. I was indeed, but just not up, just west. Sideways, over, over a bit. <laughs> yes. Over that way a bit. Just yeah. like he is now. <laughs> Thanks, John. So <laughs> what I always say is that uh, if you're travelling from... London to Middlesbrough, or indeed if you're travelling from New York to Washington, you are on a longer journey than you would be travelling from your home to the International Space Station when it's overhead, which undermines the whole history of space. But yes, uh, so yes, I was in Washington DC and Virginia a couple of weeks ago, giving a 
uh, what what I'm told was a, a marvelous um, presentation and talk to uh, the U.S. Army's Futures Command. But that's not what this is about. This is um, uh, going to uh, in recreational time, going to the Smithsonian Museum, which I've not been to since 2007, and uh, things have um, have changed quite a bit in in there. There's a lot of the um, uh, the, the exhibits that are, that are now closed down because they're going through a lot of refurbishment. But since I was in Washington, I thought well, I would just pop in and go and take a look. And when I went and took a look in the Smithsonian on the um, on the National Mall uh, 12 years ago, I wasn't as as infatuated with the space race then as as I am now. And when I went to go and see it then, I don't remember Skylab being in there or a, a mock-up of the Skylab module being in there, which is basically just the first stage of a Saturn V rocket that was converted into uh, America's first space station. That Al Bean and Pete Conrad uh, went to go and visit um, and and made repairs on it and lived in there for I can't remember how long it was weeks I think um, and there's everything from reconstructed V two rockets um, that were captured from Poonamund after the the Second World War there's um, uh, Dave Scott's spacesuit in there. Um, and, and also Neil Armstrong's space suit. I was really disappointed to see just how clean it was that they'd, they'd taken all the moon dust off, which to me, I, I think that is absolutely criminal. Why would you clean it up to put it on display? Mm. I don't know. Use it for science. S- science? Maybe they can do some weird science about how... Well, they- They'd only just cleaned it, haven't they? It was this, this was like last year. It was just for the Apollo celebrations. They 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 reconditioned it. Philistines. Uh, yeah. yeah. Keep it filthy. <laughs> just like this podcast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know, there's Gemini capsule in there. There's a uh, an Apollo capsule in there. Um, it's. Uh, it it really is. If um, if anybody hasn't been to the Smithsonian, particularly for our American listeners in in um, in America, they re- our American listeners in America, yeah. they really should go along to the Smithsonian Museum. And I would also say that one one of the museums that really gets missed out is its sister museum over the river um, in Virginia, the Udvar Hazy Museum, which is basically the overspill from the Smithsonian because in the Air and Space Museum on the Mall, they can't put that much stuff in there, in there, so they cram it. For filled with like the Kitty Hawk flyer, the very first airplane that the Wright brothers flew and Hmm. um, the mock-up of the um, uh, Voyager spacecraft and I think it's the Mariner spacecraft or or Mariner um, lander on Mars and kind of like the the really big ticket items but that are small in size. You go over to the Udvar Hazy Museum, and that's where you've got the really big, impressive stuff. So you've got like an SR seventy one Blackbird in there. You've got the um, the N- uh, no, what's it called? The um, Enterprise, which I think was the um, the first shuttle that didn't have engines in it, and it was yeah, used it was the, for glide the, tests. That was the aerodynamic prototype. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, so that's in there as well, and. The, the one when I went to go and see that in 2007 that really gave me shivers was when you, you walk up to this big, pla- big big silvery plane and then you see on the front it's got Enola Gay written on it. Enola it's like, Gay. Oh. a little boy today. Which, if you didn't listen to oh, oh. OMD in the 80s... <laughs> I like OMD. ...is the, the plane that live. dropped the... Uh, you see, uh, have you? I have. Mm. I have. I've seen OMD. Seen OMD. They're very good. You're a very good band. They're very mm. good. Very mm. good. So in summary, yeah, go to go, both of them. Go, yes, yeah. If um, if you've never been to the Aerospace Museum on the Mall, the National Mall in Washington, and you're in America, more for you. Why wouldn't you go there? And if you have gone there but you've not been to the Udvar Hazy, definitely go there because there's some fantastic oversized exhibits there that they couldn't get onto the Mall. Definitely go and see the Udvar Hazy as well. Awesome. Cool. Uh, chin chin. I'm going to read out the email because I think otherwise it's really you heavy. Oh, it is, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. It's all me. So, I mean, I do like the sound of my own voice, but yeah, it's probably best you Yeah, it. so you I'm going to read out the email. So, on to the emails. Emails. And it's our good friend, Mark DeVries, some say DeVray, uh, emailed us to say, Oh, most magnificent and terrifying Martian overlords and your earthly queen of the Welsh... Jenny. I mean, it's all almost right. Earthly Queen of the World. <laughs> but you know. 
Wales is such a small quarter of the globe for you to rule these days. I know. So, a quick one. I was listening to another podcast recently. <gasps> we just follow with it. Please forgive me, but I needed to do something to fill the yawning void between awesome astronomy episodes. So, hmm. clawed that well back there. Yeah, I mean, what 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 do people do with their lives between episodes? I don't know. Probably yeah. listen to old episodes. Yeah, I, I would. <laughs> Specifically, the Houston We Have a Podcast podcast from NASA. That is a good podcast. In episode uh, 113 last week, they had an interview with Andrew Chaikin on the lessons of Apollo and how they can take that forward to Artemis. I thought it was a particularly good interview with someone outside NASA, but who has great insights into the organisation, a mix of Apollo history and a healthy dose of reality for the future, i.e. not the usual NASA rah, rah, rah attitude. Listening to it, I thought that it would be the sort of interview Ralph would find interesting, so if you haven't already heard it, I thought I'd bring it to your attention. Thanks, as always, for all your work in bringing us the amazing podcast. Best wishes, Mark. Mm. So, Ralph, did you listen to it? I did, Um, and thanks for bringing that to our attention, because I wasn't even aware of that podcast, and I did take a listen to it, and I would also recommend people listening to all of those podcasts, because it's basically somebody from NASA, um, or from the Johnson Spacecraft Center, or Space Flight Center in Houston, that uh, has a chat with a different person each uh, week, I think it is, Um, and in this episode it was Andrew Chaikin, and then in a subsequent episode there's one from a uh, lunar scientist uh, that's well worth taking a listen, because that's about the lessons from uh, Apollo, what we learned from Apollo, what we learned about the moon from Apollo, and what we're going to learn when uh, American astronauts um, land on the moon again under Project Artemis. Uh, Go and take a listen to those, I would definitely recommend it, and this is one of those where um, you mentioned there that it'd be the sort of interview that 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 I'd find interesting. What I really want to do is um, just he's he's one of those people that just understands Apollo so much, a, a bit like Gavin Price in the UK, where you just want to sit down and just have a chat and just see where it goes to because everything about. Apollo when you um, and I'm going all fanboy now that Paul will hate but it's one of those where when you start getting to the minutiae of of how things happened and then start taking it into the big picture things about how Apollo came along how it was actually even came along uh, how it was even funded and and continued the funding and actually materialized given all the setbacks which was kind of one of the uh, the themes of Gavin Price's talk at Astro Camp last time it's just such a fascinating thing to kind of bat around and the idea of sitting around, sitting down with um, with Andrew Chaikin and uh, with a with a microphone and having the the, the tape rolling yeah, that that really does appeal to me, and there's, there's quite a lot of other people like that. And and if I ever find the time, then um, yeah, I'll um, I'll certainly put a request out there. Cool. So, if you're as enthused about it as Ralph is, um, the podcast again was Houston. We have a podcast and episode one one three. So, on to the news. Uh, Paul, I want you to do your news because otherwise it's just Ralph, Ralph, Ralph. <laughs> it goes on a bit, doesn't it? So, um, can you do your news first and then we'll come back to Ralph. Okay, thank you. And so, on to the news. And Paul has got a kind of little, little roundup of bits and bobs for us, I think, this month. So, take it away. Yeah, nothing. No, no one big story. Just lots of little little stories you might have missed. So, first of all, the James Webb, the James Webb Space Ooh. Telescope, Ooh, an has passed. I know it's got an update. It's passed its sun shield test with flying colours for the first time. The five layered hey. shield was unfurled and put under tension, which is good news. It all worked. Um, as this has to work first time when it's deployed a million miles from home with no possibility of repair, and it's very important because it protects it from the sun and regulates um, all the heat of the instruments. So it's a good job it worked. So did they do this multiple times? To see? I think they did it just the once, and it worked. Don't know whether they're just going to go, yep, that's it, okay, I hope it works. Who knows? Anyway. Oh, I love a space mission based on hope. Mm. <laughs> so next, the ever mysterious X-37B. <laughs> the diminutive of the United States Air Force space plane has landed back on Earth again after a record-breaking 780-day trip. 
Wow. Um, this was OTV5, um, and it beat the record set by the previous mission, OTV4. It beat it by 62 days. Um, it's carrying various experimental payloads for the US military, and beyond that, little is known. Um, although there was what is known that there was a, a heat expansion experiment on board on this one. Uh, though there seems to be a little bit of controversy because it's it was suggested in the announcement that it launched some microsatellites during the mission, but uh, these haven't been declared to the UN, which you have Ooh. to do. You have to sort of declare because you have to get get a, a registration number so everybody knows that thing exists. It's in orbit. And it seems to suggest that the, there were some microsatellites released in this, this mission that, that weren't declared. Um, there's argument about whether that is, is the case or not. It's mixed up with something else. But it does seem to suggest that there's some shenanigans from the US Air Force. Well, that would be interesting to know, because I'm not aware of this myself, whether mm. um, uh, spy satellites... Uh, actually have a designation. Yeah, they do. The UN. They do. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. You have to sort of declare their, their kind of existence, but mm. that's it. You have to say anything yeah, else. I think because otherwise they can't avoid collisions, right? Mm. And all that. Yeah, I think that it's basically... I, it's I assume the, that's what it's for. It's just... It, you, yeah. They don't mm. have to specify what it's doing. They just have to say, oh, it's there. by yeah. the way, there's this thing. Yeah. So uh, by convention, you're it. supposed to declare them, but apparently, yeah, there, there seems a suggestion that X-37 released some microsatellites that, that weren't or haven't been declared. Interesting. Anyway, SpaceX seems to be getting uh, Dragon 2 back on track after they released footage of the Super Draco engines in the capsule undergoing a test firing and nothing blew up. Um, <laughs> hey! And the other footage um, was released showing the best bits of 700 tests and also with nothing blowing up. Cool. So, as we said last year and the 14 times before that, commercial crew is not far away. <laughs> uh, though the update today was that they think a test stand firing of the capsule um, was going to happen sort of by the end of this month, by the sort of in November, and that the abort test, the, the kind of aborted abort test, uh, will happen in December. So we could be very close to um, a, a crude launch. Actually, we could we could be actually a matter of weeks away in, in the big scheme of things. And if they're following wow. NASA's procedures, then the abort tests on Orion were the last tests they did before certification. So that yeah. might mean then that and the, by December they've got a fully. Actually, looks like Boeing prep. isn't far behind either. They were talking about their abort test. The big thing I think now with Dragon is the, the parachute um, issue. Um, that's that's mm. nothing's been said about that so we'll mm. see what happens um nasa has announced a rover mission to the moon to launch in 2022 to look for uh, i've put watering in this script to look for water <laughs> um in the south polar region it's called viper the volatiles investigating polar exploration rover and i already hate it um, <laughs> it'll be about the size of a golf cart and interestingly will need to last 100 days so we'll need to survive and operate in the lunar night so Ooh. new technology new new uh, experiences going on there. Mm. Uh, this incidentally will be the first robot mission sent to the moon to support a human landing since Surveyor 7 in January 1968. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Wow. Good that. So, things are moving apace um, with the UK spaceport in Scotland with the release of drawings for the site. Um, they do include a viewing area, so if you fancy seeing a rocket launch in Europe, Scotland might well be on your holiday list in a couple of years' time. Um, I'd pack uh, a bit warmer than you would for Florida, mind. And also, I'd book a really long stay near there because it's the, the weather, weather <laughs> means yeah. that there's going to be a lot yeah, of a lot aborted of launches. I lot was going to say, They're going to build yeah. a viewing area. Um, so, yeah, and it's all very green and eco. It's all sort of going to be grassed over and you, you almost won't see the, the launch facility. Mm. So, um, next, Virgin Galactic cool. have revealed their spacesuits. And I use the term very lightly <laughs> uh, for use <laughs> in their free flying roller coaster. Uh, it's made by Under Armour, the maker of underpants for sporty types. Uh, they are blue and look like something from Star Trek. That's and also, all. they've just floated. Virgin Galactic have just floated <laughs> themselves on the, stop, on, the, on the stock market, on the stock market yes. haven't they? Yes. Uh, which does not mean that they are any closer to being able to give. Uh, no, I'm not going to go down that ranting nope. line, but Virgin Galactic, it's yeah. not going to happen. No. Nope. And nope. last for me 
It's the uh, announcement that Northrop Grumman will be naming their next Cygnus supply ship, which is NG-12, due to launch on an Antares rocket on the 2nd November, the SS Alan Bean. Oh! In honour of the Apollo 12 moonwalker, Skylab oh, inhabitant, yeah. artist, and all-round nice guy. Oh, that's um, great. This is now oh, the Northrop Bingo. tradition for Cygnus, um, uh, with NG-11, for instance, earlier this year being the SS Roger Chaffee. Oh, that's cool too. Um, I assume SS now means spaceship, because... Yeah. When I saw that, it was an SS being steamship. Or Schutzstaffel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we go uh, back to the 30s. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that gives a whole new meaning mm. to, like, to it. Anyway, um, there we go. That's me done. Oh, I've still got Beano's number in my phone. And uh, I don't do ring it, it do in case... Do uh, call it? Because it just upsets his wife. When I'm there going, Bino, he's still there. He's still there. Well, maybe they buried it with him. Oh. oh. And, and you'll be standing over his, you'll be standing on his grave and all you can hear underground is, do 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 That could be the start of a new conspiracy theory. <laughs> right. Steering this conversation hmm. somewhere back on, I don't know, in the vicinity <laughs> of the right track. See if you can get through your news, Ralph. Well, we've already been to the moon, so it's really easy to return there and put down roots. Is not a phrase you'll hear us say on this show, because it's phenomenally hard. It's really dangerous, and it requires new technology development each time, well, each and every time you attempt it. Uh, Project Artemis is the newest incarnation of Bush 1's Space Exploration Initiative and Bush 2's Project Constellation to return to the moon and then put footsteps on Mars. This time around, it has no real additional funding, but it has the great advantage of the new Saturn V-like rocket, the new Apollo-like capsule, and a huge, innovative and agile commercial space sector. So launching to the moon is in hand. Surviving the seven-day minimum trip is in hand. Landing and launching from the surface of the moon is kind of in hand with a commercial lunar lander that hasn't yet been consumed by the moon programme, but it could be. So if we gloss over the new space station around the moon known as the Lunar Gateway, which is the least critical component of the moon program. That leaves the development of the 21st century technologies to allow longer duration habitation in space and on the moon still to develop. And if you've been listening to this show for the past few months, you'll know that NASA are funding all sorts of technologies that appear weird and fanciful to the untrained ear, but absolutely critical to the discerning space exploration nut, like all of our listeners are. And I've got a list here of the latest round of NASA funding for demonstration prototypes, which are all pretty darn cool. So we've got a ground demonstration of producing and storing hydrogen and oxygen that represents rocket and spacecraft propellant that could be produced on the moon. This being to prove out large scale propellant production plants suitable for the moon's surface. An electrolysis technology to process ice and separate the hydrogen and oxygen. The molecules could then be cooled to produce fuel for returning from the moon. A system to make propellant from permanently frozen water, which we know exists at the moon's poles. SpaceX are working with NASA's uh, Marshall Space Flight Center to develop special nozzles for refueling spacecraft, which is kind of like in-flight refueling from a tanker plane to a military aircraft. But in this case, it'll be with spacecraft. That's cool. Uh, And for the SpaceX fanboys, this also includes SpaceX's Starship vehicle. Mm. So that's something to get excited about because that's never been mentioned as part of Project Artemis before. Sustainable energy generation, storage and distribution. Scalable and modular fuel cell and hydrogen power sources that are cheaper and more reliable for use with lunar rovers, surface equipment and lunar habitats. This tech, of course, will have huge spin-off potential on Earth in years to come as well. Uh, environmental control, thermal control and life support systems for lunar missions that maintain acceptable operating temperatures throughout the moon's day and night cycle that varies from minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit to 260 degrees Fahrenheit and the important thing there being that it's throughout the moon's day and night cycle which lasts far longer on the moon than it does on Earth meaning that you know this is for long duration stay. Then and uh, a... for those of us who, you know, do temperatures in sensible units... <laughs> well, we do have more American listeners than British now. We've always had more American listeners than British, ever since I've joined, anyway. Since you joined, yeah. You, you, you've you attracted the Americans. Yeah, apparently my uh, whimsical Welsh charm is very interesting. 
to the Americans. For, for us who use, you know, uh, oh God, what are they? Metric temperature units. Yes. Uh, minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit is minus 173 degrees Celsius. And 260 degrees Fahrenheit is almost 127 degrees Celsius. So, Thank you very much, Welsh Queen Jenny. You're you're entirely welcome. I feel like you're uh, trying to suck up to me a little bit now because of the amount of uh, shit that's been coming out of your mouth. Because <laughs> of this wine. <laughs> I, I, you should literally see the size of the glass of wine he's drinking. Oh God. It's practically think, a vase. It, it's basically a I was going to say, I think wine. I've rubbed off well on him and it's a pint glass, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it is a vase. It, it is, or it a vase is. for our American listeners. Yeah, full of, <laughs> full of wine. <laughs> um, next up, because <laughs> it's still going, um, NASA are funding a flexible radiation-hardened power controller that can be configured based on the mission's power needs at whatever location. And this might make you sit up and take notice. NASA are saying this gives the flexibility for any of their moon, Mars, or Europa destinations. Ooh! Mm. There, I've gone and said it. An autonomous navigation software solution for CubeSat so they can traverse space without talking to Earth. They're going off. The robots are going off into space. It's beginning. And finally, sensors that monitor the structural health and safety of inflatable space habitats located in orbit or on the surface of other worlds. So the inflatable space habitats that were suggested a decade ago, but they went a little bit quiet, are now back in NASA's plans for off-world habitation. And the pace of all this is just phenomenal because they are just seeding so much money into corporations to be able to develop Mm. these new technologies that are going to enable uh, long duration exploration of the lunar surface it's a hell of a lot of indeed it is a hell of a lot going on it is and it's also focusing down these are the the kind of last phases of the integration phases of of how you develop these into real solutions rather than just testing things out they've been doing that over the last few years but now they're getting to the point of real technologies and these are also going to be useful on earth as well so next up because i'm still not done um it's the you are never ever allowed to have a go at me for going on (laughs) in the news ever (laughs) well i heard a little rumor you might be editing this so i (laughs) so i thought you thought you'd write a massive script and get (laughs) full (laughs) verbosity So this is in the area of human contamination of other worlds, which I'm sure will be interesting to you, Jem. Um, now, you're probably aware that NASA and other space agencies take steps to prevent the contamination of other worlds from bacteria and germs that are carried on uh, planetary spacecraft. Uh, for example, mm. there are many categories of contamination potential, with the Sun and Mercury being Category 1, meaning basically explore away, nothing's going to live there all the way to Category 5, where contamination could alter the course of evolution on that world or spread Earth bacteria that could frustrate searches for life there, Europa being subject to Category 5 protections. But this year, NASA undertook a review of their planetary protection guidelines, and there are some recommendations that will certainly have you, Jen, and quite a few listeners worried because they feel some protections are perhaps a bit too stringent and they could be relaxed. No. 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 <laughs> so Wrong. Hear, hear me out. Go the other way. Or rather hear, more hear them out. <laughs> more stringent, more red tape. No, no. <laughs> more, not less. No. Yes. So Mars is considered category four. There's a good chance microbial life could be hibernating under the surface and in ancient ice deposits there. But we know from robotic exploration that much of Mars is hostile to life. So they recommend those regions being downgraded to Category 2, which doesn't require such stringent decontamination attempts and no. ways of decontaminating spacecraft before they land there. No. Now, my point, however, would be we're not interested in exploring areas that are hostile to life because... We're searching for life whenever we send spacecraft to Mars. So a downgrading is pretty immaterial, including its pointless recommendation to downgrade the parts of the moon away from ice deposits in permanently shadowed craters to Category 1. It just seems pointless to me. And because we learn exponentially more about our solar system and its planets than we did 
when we started caring about contamination back in 1958, the review board recommends further reviews twice each decade to take account of new understanding and proposed missions to relevant bodies. Although the review board is chaired by the eminently revered Alan Stern, who's the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission to Pluto and a former associate administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, a lot of this, however, to me, just sounds like job creation and doing something for the sake of it to me. I don't think these changes needed to be made. That said, what I do consider to be quite useful is the recommendation that NASA accelerate the development of a dedicated facility on Earth to receive and house the samples collected by the Mars 2020 rover to make sure that we're ready for anything epic we might discover there and reduce the risk of cross-contamination. Now, we had these contamination de- or um, decontamination facilities for the Apollo uh, missions, and we have done ever since we've brought back samples from asteroids so I'm not sure whether we actually need new decontamination facilities for the the, the 2020 uh, rover and what that will bring back. And the mission to actually bring samples back from Mars hasn't even been devised yet. It is, at the moment, it's send the Mars 2020 rover over there, prepare samples ready so that another future spacecraft could go over, collect these samples and bring them back. So at the moment, it just kind of seems like, can we... I'll Can we dispense with all this review? I'm, I'm going to tell you what it's going to bring back. Go on. Rocks. It'll certainly be rocks. Just just rocks. It'll be rocks. There, there'll be f- all on them, rocks. Nothing at all? Nah. You need to go rocks. under the rocks. Just uh, just rocks. More rocks. If they go about 20 metres down in Cydonia. Well, yeah, it's obviously not here. Yeah. Yeah, but they won't find us. No. But the rest They'll of never just, find it's us. Just, it's just rocks. Never find us. It's just rocks. Yeah. Everyone's getting excited. It's just rocks. There you go. You heard it from Paul. And he knows. Hmm. He's a Martian. Exactly. A wily Martian. Or cynical. T- so I, uh, before we get on to the big bit news, I am going to interrupt with a bit of, well, I say breaking news. It's breaking news as we're recording. By the time you guys are listening, it's not breaking news anymore. But we're going to pretend like it is still breaking news anyway. <laughs> so... Beep, 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 beep. This just in. NASA has funded Southwest Research Institute to study the plausibility of sending an orbiter to Pluto. Oh. Still doesn't make it a planet. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Dwarf planet Pluto. You know, it still is dwarf planet and it's still interesting. Um... So the study that they funded is for them to develop a possible spacecraft, uh, work out the costs of the whole mission, uh, compile a risk assessment, things like that. Um, it's one of the 10 uh, studies that are being carried out for the Planetary Science Decadal Survey. And this is also the institute that led New Horizons. And I'm going to call it right now, it will be rejected because it's not a planet and no one will care and there will be better missions that they want to send instead. I would rather see a mission go to Uranus and Neptune. Yep. I, was about I to think say Paul same thing. would agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mission mission to Uranus, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, 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 literally, they are they are the two planets we've not really looked at. Yeah. Exactly. I want to see if we can put outboard motors on Mercury, Venus, Mars, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto... And if we can push those into Jupiter, will it turn into a sun? No. Right, and on that note, I think we're going to move on to the big news story. (laughs) (laughs) Because Ralph is definitely talking out his arse now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's because I said outboard motors rather than rockets, isn't it? Uh, They would work in space. They would work in space, outboard motors. What are you thinking, thinking, man? (laughs) <laughs> that little propeller just spinning around doing nothing. <laughs> what was I thinking? You could have got Yamaha working away on that. They'd have gone nowhere. So, damn it! Our big bit of news is another piece in the puzzle of Project Artemis. But this this one is interesting. It's a little bit controversial because how do you follow the A seven L, the iconic Apollo moon suit? Wow, that's true. It's a good question. Apparently, we have the answer. Ralph, Neo, we've heard a lot of your voice this episode, but do you want to take us through this? Because I feel like this is something <laughs> yeah. that you might get quite angry about. Or, you know, 
quite happy about. Either way, with the wine, it's going to be interesting. What you're asking me is, do I like the sound of my own voice? <laughs> and uh, the answer is definitely yes. And if we're talking Apollo and Artemis, then I would like to be involved in this conversation. But basically, they've developed a new spacesuit, which I think Paul described as uh, being like a Teletubby. I mean, it really no, is it, not a flash. It is suit. the Pepsi can. Yeah, it, it looks is. like the Pepsi can of... <laughs> I mean, what the It's an interesting it is, path to take. What the mark the fridge is that <laughs> It is absolutely a more practical spacesuit and very similar yeah. to some of the original designs that, that NASA came up with in the uh, early nineteen sixties for what a moon suit should be like. Um, than the the classic A seven L spacesuit that we're all familiar with from the Apollo era. The problem is that the <laughs> the space suit that was developed for the Apollo era is just so damn iconic. It is so cool. It was so cool when it was developed, and it's even cool now. Where What is cool from the 1960s? Oh, no, there's a lot still cool from the 1960s. Volkswagens and mm. hippie chicks. Sorry? Uh, uh, there's, there's a lot. Uh, still, there's, yeah, there's ignore loads, that. There's, there's loads. So, like, yeah. um, um, electrocuting homosexuals. Um, I'm thinking more kind of like mothers uh, and poppers. Beating up protests, and, uh, the yeah, Vietnam War. It's all yeah, cool. It's all, yeah. The 60s were amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at this from a different angle, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah it's all good. All good. There's nothing wrong with the 60s at yeah. all. Best decade ever. Yeah. You decide what Smallpox. you want to leave in from that, Jim. Small pop, yeah. <laughs> Small I think nearly pop. all of it will be going. <laughs> Now what? Anyway, yeah, so what is interesting? The advances from this new spacesuit that's going to be uh, better than the, the the last Apollo spacesuit is that uh, astronauts will be able to climb into it from the back of the suit, so it'll be easier to put on. It'll it's going to be more comfortable, and there'll be more mobility in it. Um, interestingly, one of the really big problems with um, uh, with exploring the moon and the the Apollo spacesuit and the uh, the Apollo lander is that they get absolutely filled with dust and dust there is so abrasive it's kind of like shards of glass and it gets caught in zippers it gets caught in uh, in the, the the air recycling systems it is going to be such a problem for long duration so the so the more you can cut down on having to put on gloves putting on bits of the spacesuit putting on the boots and everything like that if you can put it all in one system. Uh, it just makes it so much easier and so mm. it reduces the the amount of friction that you're going to have on each of those joints um, and um, the miniaturization of electronics that we can now do um, because we're 50 years on from Apollo and also with the plumbing systems means that they can build in duplicates for much of the systems which means that um, there's that, that, that failures of any of the systems uh, isn't going to be so much of a problem if your air pumps fail. You'll have duplicates for it. If um, any of the uh, the electronics that are in there fail, you'll have duplicate computer systems in there. In fact, you'll have computer systems in there that you really didn't have in the Apollo days um, because yeah. the uh, redundancy was a huge thing uh, for NASA uh, in the Apollo days. If the, In fact, I think the only areas where there wasn't redundancy in the system, so if a system failed, you had a backup system, was in the hypergolic fuel for being able to take off from the moon um, and the spacesuit itself, where now you have redundancy built into the spacesuit. The mobility inhibitions that were experienced in the 1960s and 70s have been overcome uh, to allow more flexibility, particularly in the knees, in the waist, in the shoulders and the arms. And that's how uh, this spacesuit looks a bit more cumbersome and um, a lot less cool than the Apollo spacesuit, but it's a lot more capable. It's a lot more flexible. It will allow people to explore better. It does mean, though, that you're not going to see astronauts falling over on the moon quite so often, but then also you won't be quite so panicked that they're about to die on the moon as well. Um, the Snoopy caps that everyone's familiar with from both the Apollo spacecraft images and when they're on the moon, they're going. Don't need them anymore because we've got Siri um so basically there's a new audio system with multiple embedded voice activated microphones inside the uh the upper torso that'll automatically pick up the astronaut's voice when they speak so basically hey siri despite being 50 years older why do apollo astronauts look better than me <laughs> uh they'll still wear nappies or diapers um because you don't want to risk following through when trying to fart on the moon uh so that's not changing <laughs> what, what was your best follow through 
<laughs> and that, that's an interesting thing. No, no matter, <laughs> no matter what technologies, what yeah. advancements there are in technologies, there is still going to be toilet humour on the moon. They've still got to wear nappies or diapers. You've still got to <laughs> yourself while walking on the moon. <laughs> yes. And um, it's going to be tested on the International Space Station uh, for the first Artemis moon landing in 2024. Um, and it'll have minor. It'll only need um, minor modifications for Mars missions in the 2030s. So it's basically the spacesuit that we see now is future proof for the next 20 years, depending on what uh, NASA decide to use it for. Interesting aside, mm. it's not a new suit. Go on. Design was first field tested over 20 years ago. Really? Yeah. Um, mm. And is it under Constellation? No. No. Got no. Go right back. Right back to like back in the late 90s um, and it's um, there's big talk about all that blue and red they put on it the hell's all that about it's, it's got to be isn't it? it yeah but it's got to be white yeah because otherwise it's, it's just going to absorb heat yes <laughs> it's just like in a blazing sunshine mm. on the surface of the moon you yeah. well, they did have the red stripes on the Apollo spacesuit, so you could oh, differentiate red, which the red, commander was. Red stripes are which about cool. inch thick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like inch wide, little band. No, this is like half the suit was blue and red. Yeah, I know, but they've probably got more heat absorbing and yeah, insulating white. materials now. It's than they white do or them. nothing. If they go yeah. like that, they they're they're being ridiculous. Hmm. Team so, America. They should just make it look just like Apollo, because yeah, there's nothing cooler yeah. than the Apollo spacesuit. No, no, God, no. Uh, no. Even you, that's uh, not an uh, Apollo you know fanboy. Uh, you've got do, you know what? do you know what? Actually, I prefer the Gemini suit. What? The silver one? No, that's the Mercury one. That's the Baker one. No, the Gemini one. I love the, the Gemini one. looks cool. Oh, for outside the spacecraft yeah, when they were doing the, the space Gemini, The Gemini one. The which is white yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, I like the Gemini one. Oh, no, that's nowhere near as cool as the... Oh, uh, the A7L is very cool, but I do like the Gemini the Apollo suit. one, especially when they start to put in the, the, the red stripes yeah, on to show the And commanders. they have the little sun shields around the side. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, They're still that. doing the gold visors. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. Cool. So, I think it's time to move on to the next section. Mm. Which is the debate. Mm. Or is it? Is it? Right, so now it's time to move on to uh, the debate to the next phase, really. Um, so over the last months, you've heard us wax lyrical and argue the case for a series of space missions. Uh, many of the great and good have fallen. Who thought Cassini would go? Oh, man, I can't mm. believe Cassini went. Oh, that just bored us out. And we have five now that have been elevated to positions of immortal greatness. Three deep space probes one space telescope, and a single crewed mission have survived to fight it out in the public arena. So we've got New Horizons, which, of course, is... The mission to Pluto mission and to Pluto. Charon, and now and going on to go and explore the Kuiper Belt for exactly, other objects. the first exploration of the outer part of the solar mm. system and a very successful mm-hmm. mission it's been, um, and has revolutionised our views of planetary formation and, and what the solar system is and how it, how it works. We've got Apollo 11, as if it needs an introduction, but Apollo 11? Not familiar. Yeah, it's something mm-hmm. about landing on the moon, first people, oh. Neil Armstrong, something like that. No, don't no, remember. No, no, not, not familiar. Um, we've got the Hubble Space Telescope. 20 years and it's still chugging. 25 years and, and, and up. Sorry, 25 yeah. years and it's still chugging. Still doing the thing, still doing the imaging. And... Then we've got Voyager. 350 years and still chugging. <laughs> <laughs> it's been going forever. <laughs> it's been going since 1977. <laughs> yeah, 42 years. Um, and, of course, it's our first proper deep space interstellar probes. Um, and then Pioneer, which actually I was surprised about. It's now become my favourite space mission, actually. Yes, because you actually you really sold that, that last... I didn't... I actually didn't know that much about Pioneer. Yeah, I started you, looking into it and it was like, man, this is an incredible really mission. sold it. And and actually, I, I really fell for Pioneer after that. I was, I was glad that one. Mm. I was like, that's an amazing mission. Um, and of course, that's, you know, almost the um, sort of Voyager before Voyager. Mm. Um, and in a way, hasn't hasn't done as, as much in terms of spectacular. But 
perhaps is more important. I don't know. But it's now over to you. Um, so on social media, we will put up the polls and you need to get voting before we record next month's Christmas special. <gasps> yeah, it's do, coming. Do, do. God, I love the Christmas special. Yeah. Jen's writing this next one. Where we will announce the winner in a glamorous star-studded awards ceremony. And by that, I mean a pub, probably. <laughs> Maybe frequented by that old actor you can never remember that was in that film with the things. Um, but we will announce the winner after the polls through November of which of these five missions you have elevated to the status of greatest space mission ever. And I think we've timed it right because clearly Artemis is coming up soon and all these, th- all these things are going to happen soon. But as a kind of almost like the, the, the last chapter of the beginning of the space age, I like to think we are, we are writing that little page at the end of the book. Oh, yeah. You're so poetic, isn't it? Oh. It's like this is it. This is it. What is the last script before we start the new before space the age? New yeah. era. The before the new era. Before we turn it's that coming. Page. It exactly. is coming, people. There it are a lot coming. of naysayers have... out there that are saying that Artemis can't happen because it's not funded. But what 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 never happened before was this burgeoning commercial space yeah, flight. Exactly. Elon Musk can take over landers. Um, mm. um, sorry, Elon Musk can take over launchers and spacecraft and um, Jeff, Jeff, Bezos Jeff Bezos can, can take over lunar landers. With his wife. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, exactly. We're, we're about to enter this era of commercial space and uh, potentially, yeah, hopefully Artemis and then these new series of explorations of Mars and things like that. We're, we're, and, and they're bigger and, and brasher and they're, they're doing far more science than ever imagined even just a few years ago so and we've got the new you know the james webb space telescope all these things we, we are about to really enter a new yeah. a new space age mm. and artificial intelligence will absolutely yeah. revolutionize what we can do with data that we've already collected over decades of observations mm. yeah so after our months of debate it's down to you guys over the next few weeks to Give us your opinions. Get those polls. Get those fingers pressing the buttons. We really want to see those fingers. We really want to see those fingers. And give us the result. Which of those five missions will be the greatest? And on that note, it's time to end. Don't forget to vote for your favourite of the top five space missions as we prepare for the final showdown. As much as the Martians will punish me for saying this, the show is nothing without you guys. You need us, we need you. It's a weird, symbiotic relationship, but it works. Well, on some level anyway. And it'll soon be Christmas and we love presents, so do bear us in mind when you're doing your Christmas shopping, or alternatively, just leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It's quite literally the very least you could do for <laughs> hours of free space and astronomy goodness. My life really hasn't amounted to much. In mm. fact, it's been one massive void of disappointments mm. that fails to even fulfil my basic needs for love and appreciation. Mm. So I take to Twitter in order to gain the adulation I crave. Join me, talk to me, send the love to at awesome Astro Pod. We're apparently on Facebook as well, but it's full of c- so I'm not. <laughs> so, <laughs> until next time, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John, and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science, and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions, or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod, or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.
It is full of curse. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> oh, God, Ralph. I hate you. I hate you so much for all the editing. I have no idea how I'm going to do this episode. Don't bother. Send it to me. I'll do it. Are you sure? Yeah, send it to me. I'll do it. I don't trust you with the editing anyway. <laughs>